Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Who Cares Anyway podcast. We are live. It is Friday night, and as usual, I'm your host, Chris Doman. We're here to have a fun conversation about, well, quite a few things. There's a lot on the docket. There's a lot of news that we want to break down, we want to get into. But first, of course, let me introduce the panel. Uh, Case Cornelisa, dude, what's up? How's your week been? Home. I finally have a good desk chair again, so yay for that. And I once again finished Game of Thrones, um, which I didn't much uh, yep, didn't just, enjoy uh, as <laughs> just, just rub it in, rub it in that you have time for that. <laughs> I did. I, I, to be fair, I didn't enjoy it as much as I should have because I have issues with season seven. I won't go into why because people on this panel haven't seen it, and they should. Anywho, uh, I had a good I had a good day. How how are you guys doing? <laughs> As I say, yeah, just rub it in, rub it in. I, I I know, guys. It's hard for me to call myself a Game of Thrones fan when I've only seen up to season four. I'm sorry, I'm working on it. But someone else that I can't feel too bad about that though because there's another person on this panel who hasn't even seen season one. I'm sorry to throw you under the bus, Nico. But he's back, ladies and gentlemen. Nico Rigoli, fresh off of successfully raising six thousand dollars. For Thon, congratulations, good sir. How are you doing this week? Well, first off, thank you very much. Thank you very much. It feels good to have uh, not only raised it, but uh, broken the goal uh, with uh, 6272 as of the last time I checked. Damn! And by the way, you can still donate. You can still donate. The link does not officially close until I believe February 15th when Thon officially begins. So if you, if you still want to donate and have not gotten a chance to yet, please do so. Click the link in the description below. I think you put the link in there. Uh, and if not, I'll just send it to you later and we can put it on, uh, uh, in post. Yeah, well, well, I'll I'll just put it on the I'll, I'll just put it on the uh, the description box after the show, um, or maybe even during the break, I'll I'll sneak it in there, but it's fine, we're all fine. Thank you. Ha- thank you. How are you? But <laughs> <laughs> but it's not just the three of us here tonight. We do actually have uh, a fourth member of the panel, and we also have another special guest. Uh, who this guy's been around the block. He's been uh around really everyone. Like he's everyone's biggest fan, and. We especially support all the support that he has thrown our way. So it only made sense that, of course, we had to have him on for for, for a, a bare minimum, at least one live show. Please, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the podcast, Jonathan Peck. Dude, welcome. How are you doing? And thank you so much for coming on. Very good, Chris. Very good. Uh, very good. Um, well, for the record, I am sort of like a movie wanderer just say that right now and more <laughs> like and more thoughtful things right here and can't wait to see my first appearance around this panel right here and can't wait to talk those about animated sequels right here and i seen a special movie i got to see very very early that none of you three seen but i will tell you i can't tell you Robert what it is. Get Robert is. Get if, it better not be the one that's related to the shirt I'm wearing. I mean, I'll, Nico. I'll give you, oh, give you a hint. Okay. Oh, so you did? Oh, that's okay. right. Yeah, no, I remember. I remember because um, because because weren't weren't they there? Uh, actually, no, no. Okay, okay. Never mind. So, so the the creative two, let's just say, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Hey, <clears throat> uh, so this is all right. But yes, so Jonathan Peck is here, and um, we are, we are going to talk about animated sequels in the second half of the show. But of course, you know we like to start this off with some movie news. Um, but uh, first things first, actually, I, I wanted to talk about this because the Schmodown Awards finally dropped last last week, and we didn't really just we didn't really get the chance to talk about um, what what Case and I were really able to do, uh, and that was the nomination. And I just wanted to, and I know I've said this many times, uh, and I even got the chance to finally tell Harloff this week on Collider Live, which uh, please, guys, go check out Collider Live. They're a great live podcast. I enjoy them every single week. Um, but, you know, I it still just baffles my damn mind that four months, four months after this channel started, we still got that nomination. It's, it's insane. But once again... 
thank you to Christian and to the rest of the Clyde crew that, you know, uh, supports us and will continue to support us. And in addition to that, I also have something uh, very exciting for, for me personally. Hey, oh, <laughs> there's a callback for you. Um, so as a lot of you guys know, I, I like to say that I'm a, I'm a songwriter and I'm a music guy, but I haven't really backed that up recently in, in my time on YouTube because this has kind of been my life the last couple of years. But I finally, I finally buckled down and uh, released a very old song of mine. I wrote it back in 2011 with, uh, with my cousin and the rest of my high school band, but we finally dropped it, and it's, uh, it's called Don't Give Up, and it's a song that um, is very personal to me because it tackles a lot of mental health and suicide-related issues. So if the rest of you guys could just do me a huge favor, uh, go to my personal YouTube page, which is just Chris Doman. Um, I am looking to change the, the uh, actual username because that username is about 11 years old, and you can really tell because... It's uh, kind of stupid. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, please, guys, go check that out and give it a share because um, I take mental health very seriously and I hope that that song is just an extension of how seriously I take it. So thank you to everyone who's checked it out so far, but let's get that number rolling. I, I want to make that song a legitimate thing. So finally, enough dicking around. Let's get into this. First bit of news for tonight. So, anybody who knows me well, they know that I don't like a certain franchise that started in 2001, directed by Rob Cohen, starring Vin Diesel and Paul Walker. Now, there have been a couple of films that I've been able to enjoy, like that first one, and Furious 7, for as stupid as it is, I can enjoy it. But Fast 5, I don't get it. Furious 6, I, or Fast 6, I don't get it. Fate of the Furious was... But we're getting a spinoff called Hobbs and Shaw. The trailer dropped yesterday. Or, sorry, rather today. Where has this movie been all my life? Like, this is the level of dumb, intense action movie I wanted from this franchise. Jonathan, uh, did you get the chance to check this out before we went live? Uh, yes. Yes, I did. Early this morning, actually. Nice. Saw it on YouTube, saw a couple of times right here, and uh, I really enjoyed it, much of it right here, though. Let me tell you my favorite part of the trailer, though. Please do. <laughs> okay. It's one of my my favorite part of the trailer when they involved they're trying to get down a building, and the rock just jump out the building right here, and Jason Statham's character trying to go to an elevator and stand right here. It just slowly <laughs> down right here. And he was holding one guy right here, and he slams down the elevator, and the rock tells to f off right here. Musically, <laughs> right here. That's one of the funniest part of the trailer. I, I I enjoyed that. See, and and that's the kind of like just sheer stupidity that I really enjoyed. Now, Case, as as a longtime fan of this franchise, I get the feeling your face is telling me you don't really care. Am I right? Look, here's the thing about the uh, Fast and Furious movies, uh, especially 5, 6, and 7. They are ridiculous, yes. But there is some kind of grounded feel to them. Um, and, of course, we, uh, I like the characters. That um, like it, It's ridiculous. And 7 is very ridiculous. But um, it... Like... It's self-aware of what it is, um, yes. but but it still is uh, like it's still serious enough uh, to be just a good fun action movie, and I think oh, that yeah. that that really Sorry. shows. Uh, second, give me one second. Sorry about that. Oh no. Okay. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah. I think that four, five, uh, or five, six, and seven know exactly what they are, and they use that well. Uh, and they still are somewhat grounded, at least um, in ter terms of what they do. I mean, yes, it's like they, they go. I was say, you might go, want to use that term a little more loosely. <laughs> yeah, okay. Look, I, I'm saying a little grounded. But that that's my entire point. This trailer looks like it doesn't care what it is. 
Like it, it, it knows that it's uh, it's going to be completely ridiculous anyway, so they don't care. And that was already kind of my issue with Fate, uh, Fate of the Furious. Like it stopped caring about what the franchise is, wh- uh, what it has been doing in the last couple of years. Um, and it's just like, oh, let, let's just do whatever. Let's just go completely ridiculous action movie. Now, am I saying that is that it's not going to be fun? Oh, it's sure going to be fun. It's just that I'm probably not going to enjoy it because this just doesn't seem like the type of movie, like the type of ridiculous action movie that I would enjoy. And I get why certain people do like it, but as someone who does actually like 5, 6, and 7, especially 5 and 7, uh, well, no, 5, 6, and 7 are my top three favorite Fast and Furious movies, I'm like, please just give me that. Uh, I mean, 7 is crazy. But I love it because of how crazy it is, because it is self-aware instead of like what this shows that it just really doesn't care. And it's just, oh, let's just do stupid, ridiculous shit with uh, the actors that we have, because that's what they want to do. Um, you guys enjoy. I want it. <laughs> and, well, and that's the thing. Like, I'm, I'm probably going to wind up enjoying it more ironically versus like genuinely well, yeah. enjoying it. Yeah, because <laughs> as I've as I've as I've gone on record saying, like this just this this franchise just isn't for me. But Nico, after seeing it, well, first off, I actually don't know your stance on Fast and the Furious. So, first off, tell me about your enjoyment of that franchise, and then tell me about uh, what you think about this trailer. I've honestly never really given this franchise the time of day and that's and like there was even some hometown uh, some hometown appeal for me to give at the time of day in in which Wiz Khalifa doing the music for Furious 7 but Uh, come come at me Wiz Khalifa fans I fucking hate him okay well that aside I'm just never really been drawn to these particular movies. And even when they showed the craziest shit in their trailers in the past, I was like, ooh, that looks crazy. Still probably not going to see the movie, though. Like, they had a car jump out of a 23-story building into another 23-story building. Yes! No, no, uh, no, 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 to be fair, that is actually, like, that's sweet, but you just, you cannot think about it for even a moment, because otherwise you're just going to be like... No, but it's awesome. Yeah. Like, like, when you can do that and have a tank jump out of a plane, and I still yeah. really don't feel the need to see these movies, you, you, eat, 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 eat your Elba with superpowers, uh, taking on The Rock and Jason Statham is not really going to do it for me. I, now, granted, the scene that Jonathan mentioned in the trailer where um, it's like the, hey, I took the easy way down, you took the harder way down to the bottom of the building. Sucks to be you. That That's funny. But I'm still pro- probably not going to see it. At least not in theaters. That's, that's a fair point. So what I think we're going to wind up doing instead with that is... I wouldn't be surprised if this one winds up making making not as much money as the rest of the other films in the franchise because, look, say what you will about the quality of Furious 7, Fate of the Furious, those are multi-billion dollar movies. And as much as that kills me to say, I can't argue with the level of success. And it's just what people what I, like. It's I the same as Transformers. Exactly. Well, exactly. Well, it's the same as Transformers. So then we're going to move on to our next wait, story. Can I say one more thing? Oh, yeah, please. Oh, sorry. Go for it. Go for it. Uh, first of all, sorry about that. I oh, had good. to take you're a good. break. So you're, good. you're good. You're good. Sorry. Sorry, that little out of breath. Um, I was going to say that not only in the past affairs, the last two films over a billion dollars, the entire franchise, all the films alone, and gross, gross over five billion dollars if you really look at it right here yeah so even though i kind of just had that conversation right here i'll just say it's like this i think it will do well even early august right here though so i think it will do very well though even when does it to see that that's true and that, and that seems to be the thing it's like it matter, it's no matter what time of year these movies are released they do well because if i recall correctly uh furious 7 was released in like june and it broke one point whatever billion uh 
Fate of the Furious was released in like March and April. It, uh, sorry, April. Well, actually, actually, the last few ones were released in April. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fast Six were released around like uh, May or around like that. So even Fast Five released in uh, April. So so this one, Hobbs and Shaw, was released in the first week of, of August right here, though. And that might be very interesting to place there in August. So it might be very interesting. That's true. That's true. <laughs> So now, Jonathan, I'll let you uh, uh, catch your breath for a moment while I uh, get us into the next story, which, you know, okay. Sometimes I like to reminisce. Sometimes I like to go back down memory lane, see if I can find something from my past and dig it up. And I remember seeing an old clip of Case saying that he was not very excited about the possibility of a certain Mr. James Gunn taking on the Marvel Cosmic Universe. And it, that got me. That that made me chuckle a little bit because when he and I talked off camera about James Gunn now not only writing the Suicide Squad sequel to 2016 Suicide Squad, he is now officially confirmed as directing Suicide Squad <clears throat> 2, aka the Suicide Squad. In case you're actually a little excited for this, yes. As someone who actually tolerates the first movie, I know that I, I know. Look, I know it's not a good movie. Nope. I know that everyone hates it. I like it. I can watch it, um, and I've liked it ever since I first saw it. Exactly. But I mean, it, it's, it's, it, a hot it dumpster, a, it's a hot dumpster fire, but it is fun. It is fun. Yeah. Um, at least, like, at least they gave us fun characters and a good soundtrack. Now, they still gave us a shit villain and a generic as fuck story but <laughs> who cares um you know what the, you know what the thing is i just love this that um J james gunn is fired from marvel for bullshit in my personal opinion and he's like you know what fuck you i'm gonna help the dcu <laughs> now that's just awesome that's I just that part what, I, I, that's just I mean um and the thing is james gunn is uh, knows how to do such a movie because he did it with Guardians of the Galaxy. Exactly. And and hopefully he is able to with the sequel. Um, Which continue funny the enough, that's what everyone's big criticism of Suicide Squad was. But it was it just... was a Guardians of the Galaxy ripoff. It really tried to do that because Guardians was popular. And I just hope that w uh, that James Gunn can actually get it on track and not have such a generic story with a bad villain. Because the characters are there. The characters are good. It's just now make sure that we actually get a good comic book movie that we have him in. Uh, continue the characters that we know and love already. Because that's the thing. I think most people did like at least that shot in Harley Quinn. You can continue with that. Hell, so, as, yeah. as, as I've um, also gone on record saying, good. that bar scene, beautiful. Yeah. yeah. One of the best parts of the movie. Exactly. And you know what, Jonathan, I'll, I'll go to you next. Um, when you hear James Gunn now basically doing Guardians for the DC universe, but having the chance to do it right, does that excite you or does that uh, scare you a little bit? That's what excites me a bit. And you know the interesting thing when I read about the article is possibly directing. And the article said like it basically he used brand new characters though. I don't think it might sort of use maybe the same characters from the last movie though. It doesn't mean like you could bring like one character in there and you'd have the brand new crew basically. Like I can see the only character might might join the possible sequel was Dash out possibly Will Smith though. That's might be one possibility mm -hmm. though. I don't think you could bring Holly Quinn back, though, do the first of Prey movie. I don't bring, like, the rest of the characters back. Even the same thing with the Joker, though. Oh, I think you bring them have the brand new story, though. So I may be interested to see James Gunn's take on it right here, though. And I'm a big fan of his Guardians movies. Even I'm a big fan of some of his earlier films right here. Even some films that he didn't direct. Yeah, there's one of them. And even though I hadn't seen, like, um, Super... I heard it's fantastic right here. It's very dark, though. But... As Case would say, <laughs> get on it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. That's Hera. I just quote her. All right. Well, nah. No, and, and you know what? That's actually a... That, that, that's also a, ve a very good point. And as much as I want to crap on the idea on principle, I, I can't bring myself to do it. Because there is... There, there just is that potential, and I just don't want them to screw it up. 
Nico, are are you in the similar boat as me, or are you are you saying this is DOA? So, first, my take on the first movie. Max Landis, uh, oh. and I know he's a controversial figure, but he once said on like, the after show of, of movie fights, uh, he said <laughs> that plot is bullshit, and it, what really matters is the characters. Do my and and uh, like that, that's the, depending on your opinion, uh, that's uh, you might disagree. But yes. <laughs> that, I feel like that philosophy applies to the first Suicide Squad in that like the plot is wonky, but the characters make you want to stay for the rest of the show. Uh, and I felt it. I, I felt something when Diablo, may he rest in peace, met his exit in the film. Uh, I, I felt like we had a reason to feel attached to Harley Quinn, to Deadshot, to Captain Boomerang, uh, to Killer Croc even, to uh, Katana maybe? But her, her arc was also a this little weird. This is Katana! Yeah, yeah, that. Um, and it, it all... It, this movie was all the first movie was also not really helped by the fact that like the animated movies had kind of beat them to it and uh, didn't yes. do, did it a little better. Yes. Um, but Suicide Squad 2, it's very interesting that we get this directorial announcement just a week after the Arrowverse decided to start bringing back the Suicide Squad, although they're calling it Ghost Protocol, so they don't get in trouble with uh, the uh, embargo. Yeah, so we'd rather get told with Paramount and Mission Possible. <laughs> well done. Yeah, but that's Paramount. <laughs> uh, Ghost Initiative, Ghost Protocol, I'm not sure. But yeah, they're, they're basically doing the Suicide Squad on the Arrowverse now with characters like Ricardo Diaz, Cupid, uh, Joe Wilson, which is Deathstroke's son, and uh, China White. So Deathstroke's son. So hey, it's, it's not, it's yeah, not, it, 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 that, that in itself is very weird. That's like right at this moment in time where James Gunn is like, "Oh, I'm directing this." A week before, TV Land is like, "We're gonna do our." That's, mm, but again, though the, it. I, I don't know why they have to do that though, because they're they're two separate properties, right? Yeah, yeah. The Balanti verse right here, they're very separate from the film division right over here, though. It's very well, different. There was an embargo. There, there was an embargo for a long time, and they were they were going to do the Suicide Squad around like Arrow season one or season two, and because of the Suicide Squad movie, the first one, uh, and, and as well as a bunch of other things. Uh, the CW got hit with an embargo that prevented them from doing anything that the movies were really going to do. And, f- and like eventually that embargo was lifted, and so now we've gotten uh, Tyler Hawkland as Superman. We've gotten uh, Grant Gustin as Barry Allen the Flash and everything in between from that. Uh, and now we have Gotham City, and Batwoman is getting her own show in the future, which starts production in a couple months. Uh-huh. So like the embargo... Uh, well, it's starting production. It's starting production in in April, I think. But oh, yeah. Sorry. But I, I yeah, like, like so, there was an embargo. It, it's it's no longer a thing. And Hold yeah, on. now now Chris is pissed. <laughs> yeah, that weird look for a second. Yeah, that 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 was full of shit, right there, Nico. And I'm I'm not apologizing for it. So uh, let's just move on to the next story. Yeah. You know, and that is, so, okay, worst kept secret in the world. Ben Affleck is now out. I, I did skip a story in the in the thing because I want to save that story for last because it's just. It's glorious. It's glorious. So we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll get there in a minute. I know what you mean. Yeah, we'll get there in a minute. Let's, uh, let's get this out of the way first. Yes, let, let, let's, get, let, let's get this out of the way first. So, oddly enough, now that Batfleck is officially done, you know what? Okay, I'm. I'm not even. I'm not even mad. I'm looking forward to see what they can do with Matt Reeves because Matt Reeves, at least as far as, far as his last two films are concerned, he's two for two. Dawn and War for the Planet of the Apes knocked it out of the damn park. So if he is truly, you know, committing to the idea of being serious about making this film happen for a June 2021 release date, okay. All right, then let's be serious. Let's make it happen. Let's cast a great Batman who can do a lot of films, who won't have an issue with contract. Or aging. Or aging. 
or alcohol problems. Sorry, Ben. <laughs> or very personal stuff we don't don't need to, but okay. Yeah. But that being said, uh, Case, I can presume uh, a rant is coming? Or are you just done caring at this point? I, I, I'm kind of done caring. Look, um, Affleck was a good Batman for the few movies he was in. Um, the writing fucked him over in BVS, in my opinion. Yes. Um, the, 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 seriously, the best amount of screen time he had was a Suicide Squad, and that was two minutes. But... That was Batman, and he did really embody Batman uh, in that movie. And in Justice League, he was fine. It's just that Justice League is garbage, uh, but he was fine in it, you know? Um, but the thing is, I'm kind of beyond caring about this franchise. This is a franchise that needs to change everything to get back on track. Aquaman apparently was a step in the right direction, uh, I haven't seen it yet. Uh, I will probably see it when it's uh, finally available. I, I don't know who they'll cast as the new Batman. As, as long as it's just someone like in his early 30s, I think you should go there and not cast someone who's in his mid-40s, already a little bit too old to uh, have that role and to be able to continue it. So uh, Matt Reeves is a good director. I hope I hope they ca- cast a good Batman, and I hope that they stop caring about uh, trying to catch up with the MCU because they should realize you can't. I was about and to you say, just, and, well, and you just have to make your own good movie. It's funny you say it because Harloff and I were just talking about this on Monday, so you know, Uncle Hyder live. Okay. So, um, but yeah, no, and he brought up a great point that Aquaman was the first time since Wonder Woman and. For the first time ever in the, and that was the first time ever in the franchise that they stopped trying to be Marvel. Yeah. So, I think that while I'm, I'm still probably not gonna like Aquaman all that much once I finally do see it and just stop being broke. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Your money or just general? Yeah, money. Yeah, it's just money. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but you know what? <sighs> What what he brought up was that it it took them, it took them for the success of Wonder Woman to realize oh we need to stop being the MCU, yeah, and then they finally got that right on uh, Aquaman. It looks like Shazam. Now after seeing that second trailer, it's looking a lot less like an MCU movie as I've noticed. Even though I'm still probably not gonna like it that much either. But Nico, you you hear about. Batfleck done, and you hear about Matt Reeves' film for June 2021. Are you on our level of apprehension, or or are you like Case, and you just don't care anymore? Okay, so I might actually go on a rant here. Uh, and okay. So, I, I just, I just mentioned in the last segment, what are the shows in the Arrowverse? It's Arrow, it's Flash, it's Supergirl, it's Legends of Tomorrow, it's Black Lightning, uh, it used to be Constantine, and uh, uh, coming soon, Batwoman. Not Batman, Batwoman. Why? Because Batman has been done to death in every single thing. He's gotten movies, he's gotten TV shows, he's gotten video games. Eventually, that character uh, overstays its welcome. That's why you go for something a little different. That's why the CW is going with Batwoman instead. That's why Young Justice uh, uh, is... Uh, putting Dick Grayson and Tim Drake at sort of the center of, well, not the center, but at the forefront uh, along with the other younger heroes. That's why Dick Grayson is the focus of Titans as opposed to Bruce Wayne. Uh, And that's why I think we're a lot more people will be excited because a Batman beyond film has uh, an animated Batman beyond film has been announced as opposed to just another typical Batman film of any kind it's okay. because bruce wayne yeah. has just been overdone and we i want i personally want something different and the same applies in the case of like superman what are the dceus of uh, uh, most popular films aquaman wonder Woman, because we hadn't seen those yet we hadn't seen those yet in live so action on the big screen it's a thing it, like, it, uh, if you see something too many times in the same medium it'll eventually get stale and th- that's where i feel like uh, we've gotten with 
the character of Batman, regardless of who plays them, regardless of how good Ben Affleck was as the character, it's just gotten stale in my by opinion. The, by the way, also the reason that those movies worked is because they were actually good. The other ones were of bad quality. They weren't well constructed movies. That's At least the issue. more director focus and more yeah. focus. Yeah. Just say that. I was going to say, Jonathan, to sort of build off that point for a moment, uh, you know, what, what are your quick thoughts on the news? Well, to piggyback where Nico's pointing out, I think the one way you should do with the new Batman is go Batman Beyond. Go like a younger Batman. Terry McGinnis, and... make it happen. <laughs> well, yes. Michael B. Jordan, and... Terry McGinnis. I. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I was going to say John Cho, but yeah, okay. Uh, uh, I was going to say, like, uh, yeah, Batman Beyond. I think if you wanted to do re- reimagine Batman, you go with Batman Beyond, though. Or how about this? If Ben Affleck doesn't want to be Batman, then don't be Batman. Be a mentor to the new Batman, though. You don't have to wear to do most of the fighting. Just be at least a mentor, at least talk about mentor the new Batman. Be like sort of like if you watch the animated series about Batman Beyond, this is might be working for that. So. I think you might go with that, or if you want to go younger Bruce Wayne, cast a young Bruce Wayne somewhere in somewhere in his mid twenties right here. So how to make sure that will work? Like, like an Ansel Elgort, a Taron Egerton, something like that. Or I was gonna say Dell O'Brien, but yeah, huh? yeah, he he would actually work pretty well too, considering uh, he has been in a film with the real Batman, Michael Keaton, and American training, Assassin. and training by Batman. So yes, yes. <laughs> Actually, I, I've been seeing a lot of tweets for that, is that that's what they should do moving forward, is bring back Keaton as old man Bruce Wayne, and then moving forward, that's how they would do it. And I don't hate that on principle. I just don't think he would want to do that. Just because and, he's, and, just because he's had a career resurgence recently. And yeah, I don't and know it was how, in the MCU. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, but... To piggyback off of old Batman reclaiming, uh, uh, old Batman reclaiming the role to be sort of a mentor to a Terry McGinnis character, Kevin Smith, and I don't know if he's been pushing it lately, but for a long time, he on and off, he's pushed the idea of Clooney returning to have that mentor role. Okay, I'm not. I'm okay. Okay, Batman Robin is in like my top twenty hated films of all time, but I want that. I don't. That's it's just like how I want Hayden Christensen in episode nine. I want that so that way he can get his one chance of being redeemed for that awful role, awful, awful performance. Okay, Nico, well done. Let's move on to the next story. Up next on the docket, we have, and this is a quick thing for me. Um, actually, Jonathan, I were you familiar with Filmstruck? Uh, yes, and. Little, unfortunately, I didn't have to subscribe to the Photoshop program because due yeah. to many reasons. Yeah. yeah. Well, the Sorry. reason why, because I don't have, I have a lot of money things. I just can't get through it. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. And yeah, no, it's kind of the same thing. Like that was the one subscription service I wish I could have had when it was still a thing, but I just didn't. But now I'm going to have a chance to, once again, to get have access to the Criterion Collection through this new streaming service for just films that are on the Criterion Collection, uh, the Criterion Channel. It'll probably cost like 15 bucks a month or something like that, but you know what? To be honest, I'll pay Worth it. it. I'll, 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 once, I, once I you know have full-time work again, I will make... I, I will, was thinking, but you're broke. <laughs> again, once I have full-time employment again, I will make it happen because... I love some classic films, and who knows? Maybe I'll uh, sneak uh, some of you guys my password if you ask really nicely. Uh, <coughs> hint, hint, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, case. <laughs> all right, all right. anything, continue. <laughs> yes, yeah, fine, fine. Well, speaking of films that are in the Criterion Collection, I don't know why Hidden Figures isn't in there yet. Give it a little time. It'll make its way in there. But that was a like 20, But that was a 15, 20 years, I think. Oh, yeah. I don't know what the Criterion Collection works, but... Uh, I, I think it's, like, think. five years. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think it's only that. So, two more years. Yep. And that movie yeah. was wonderful. It was a delight. It yes. was fun. But let's, uh... 
let's talk about what that director's got going on next. Theodore Melfi has a new project coming up with uh, <clears throat> with with none other than one of the wonderful actors of our time. Woody Harrelson is in negotiation to star in his upcoming film Fruit Loops, which by by every stretch of how it's how it's been described essentially it sounds like the modern day version of one flew over the cuckoo's nest the jack nicholson um milos foreman classic and to be honest woody harrelson has the kind of charisma that i think he could carry a, a, a movie like this where it's more so a great character study about a person in in a mental hospital and i think he's got the chops like, case I, I know that you loved Hidden Figures when it came out. Yes. Um. So you hear about this project? Would this be something that would interest you? I haven't seen One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, so I can't say a whole lot about this. Well, no, and, uh, and to be fair, I'm just using it as a comparison because it's no. no, no. It, I I know. Um, look. I, Woody Harrelson is a good actor, uh, depending on what movies in, because he's also been in lots of good movies. But um, he's a good actor. He could lead this. Um, let's see more of a cast. Let's see a trailer. Let's see more of this, because this is not enough for me to say I'm yes. excited. So that's it. Yes. All right. And uh, Jonathan, you're hearing some of this news. What are what are your thoughts on? Mr. Melfi's next project. Um, I'm very interested. It was an interesting premise around here. Like, I've been waiting for that director to do more work, though. He said, with Ten Figures and St. Vincent right here, he's been sort of low-key, like, interesting directors to look out to right here, though. And I like the interesting premise behind it around here. I like Woody Harrelson. I like his films, even with the Mike material right here. This premise could work right here. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Nico. I'm not right for You probably, uh, did, did you catch Hidden Figures when it came out? So I did not catch Hidden Figures, but I heard Jonathan mention St. Vincent. Yes. So, uh, uh, the Bill Murray. Yeah, this is a, movie. I enjoy that movie. I okay. enjoy that movie. So I, I feel like, I, I feel like complex characters such as what we got from Bill Murray in St. Vincent, we'll probably get from Woody Harrelson in Fruit Loops as well. And I'm very curious to see what, how, how that looks, how that looks, because I myself have not seen One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, so this would probably be like my generation's version of that. Uh, and, you know, Woody Harrelson, he's one of those guys who you give him the phone book and he could act it out in any way uh, you tell him to. Uh, I, I want to see how he is told to act out this particular phone booth. Uh, goodness, phone booth. Goodness. Phone booth. Colin Farrell. <laughs> One of Joel Schumacher's actually good films. Yes. <gasps> what? <laughs> oh, to be it fair, Falling happened. Down is a great film. But <laughs> that's, we're not talking about uh, bad directors. Oh, guys. So up next on the docket. Um, guys, Yo. the camera's frozen. No, I I got everyone. Everyone's every. Um, we we uh, got you. We, we got you. Me. We got you. Yep. Yeah, you're good. You're oh, good. You're good. As long as uh, your thing just doesn't suddenly. Just your pictures a little bit. All right. Okay. Perfect. There we okay, go. Okay, it's working. Awesome. Technical difficulties, but hey, you know what? When do we? We're ha- when do we have a show where we don't have that? Not often. <laughs> exactly. So that's why we just roll with the punches and we keep moving on to the next news story. So. Can't wait. <laughs> this movie is officially like one of Case and Mai's most anticipated movies coming. Me too. And Jonathan. Dune! Dune. Ugh. Okay. The spice must Dune. flow. And the best part is, Denis Villeneuve, a great director who... He's never made. He's not made a bad. It's not a quote unquote <laughs> bad film in his discography. Do I like every one of his films? No, but he still makes a masterclass every time he puts the the camera on the sound on the sound booth floor. And up next, he's covering the Frank Herbert novel, and his cast list is incredible. 
just incredible. To start off, we already knew that Timothy Chalamet, Stellan Skarsgård, Dave Bautista, Rebecca Ferguson, Charlotte Rampling were already set to, to be in this thing. But this week, we got three more names to throw on that. Oscar fucking Isaac, Zendaya, and Javier fucking Bardem? Yes. I need this movie. Because I am, I am a defender of the 1984 David Lynch version. But it's hard for me to defend it. It's very hard. It's like me trying to defend Attack of the Clones. It doesn't that conversation doesn't normally end well. No. But that um, being said, do, but that being said, Jonathan, please sh- share share with the class your excitement. Put your hand in the box. Ah, yes. <laughs> well said. Ah, the pain, the pain, the pain. Ah. <laughs> I can't wait for this movie. Just if you name every cast member, I already got my money. I'm gonna plan to see legit at IMAX. Like I bet is gonna be huge. Like huge. Not only just the cast list, the director, Danny Melanou. I agree with you. He's never made a bad movie right here. And the cinematographer they gotten. It's not Roger Deakins, but they have a very good replacement that's a cinematographer behind Zero Door 30 and Rogue One right here. And you can tell that person no scale oh. very oh. well. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. And whoever cast the next character is right here, I'm actually going to be surprised and excited at the same time, though. <laughs> and a little interesting. I have a little interesting history about Dune, though, because... Please. I never saw the David Lynch version of it fully. I see a lot of clips of it, not the completed okay. one. I have seen what's in the box or the Baron Harkonnen scenes right here, though. And even that weird pixel fight with Kyle McLaughlin and Patrick Stewart, which, strangely uh, enough, he never ages since 1984, no. strangely. Patrick Stewart literally Patrick. has not aged in 35 years. I want this man's secrets. I want the unicorn blood he is clearly drinking to stay that young looking. <laughs> wait, wait, that that's young looking? It feels like he just got old very young and then hasn't gotten older <laughs> in the past 30 years. It's kind of See, like the thing. <laughs> now, Nico, he is not old. He is simply refined and mature. Sure. The line sure. must be drawn here! Yes! You're welcome. All right. I, yes, I, I, I had to go there. I had to go there. Case, <laughs> fanboy with me. <laughs> <laughs> Look, um, the movie <laughs> Nerf is, is, in my personal opinion, the best director working to date. He has not made a single bad movie. Prisoner, uh, Prisoners is my least favorite of his, and it is a great movie. Then he made uh, Enemy in my top 50. He made uh, Sicario, great movie. He made Arrival, also in my top 50 of all time. And then there was this announcement of a movie of a sequel to Blade Runner. And I was like, really? A sequel to Blade Runner? Who the fuck asked for this? No one did. No one wanted this movie. No one expected anything from this movie. Then you see it. It is one of the best sci-fi movies ever made, in my opinion. It is so gorgeous and brilliant, and I love it so much that it has actually crawled its way in my uh, top ten of all time. It is so beautiful, and it just makes me realize this guy can do no wrong. Anything he touches is just brilliant. And uh, if you see this cast, it's like Oscar Isaac as the dad of Timothy Chalamet, who have, both actors have been so great in movies recently. Um also, remember the last time that Dave Bautista was in a Denis Villeneuve movie? Oh, yeah. That was awesome. <laughs> so, I see you playing one half of the Harkonnen clan, basically. I just hope to God and, we don't see him in a thong like Sting. Otherwise, it's going to look real awkward. I, 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 <laughs> oh, uh, anyway. I was, thinking, um, I was thinking like a different... Actually, you know the funny thing about... I didn't mean to cut you off case, but I create some interesting fan casting lens online a couple months back after... Because the Shaman was cast in the new Doom movie, and I cast a different actor and played the stink part. I'm not gonna tell you what it is yet, but 
You're going to tease me like that? Dude. Dude. I, I, I'm not I'm not getting these references. I haven't seen the original Dune. The well, only thing I haven't I've seen the version completely, so I've seen clips of it. So oh, I don't know anything of the original source material. I don't care. The only thing that I know about it is that it's a mix between Star Wars and Lord of the Rings, two of my favorite franchises of all time, directed by my favorite director right now, and it has a couple of my favorite actors. Yes, please. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be the movie to look out for, so... Look out for it. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> exactly. And, Nico, um, I'm just going to presume you don't care at the moment. I will say that is a big cast list that this movie has. Uh, um, thank you for laying out the filmography of this particular director because, mm-hmm. yeah, I don't pay attention to directors that much. You should. That Yes. Maybe. Maybe I should. But um, obviously being a wrestling fan, anything Dave Batista is in, just hearing about it intrigues me a little bit. Uh, because, you know, making that transition from wrestling to movies, not everyone can do it. But he is so far, uh, in terms of the movies he's taken on, he's been directed well. Like uh, Drax, the Destroyer, at least in terms of Guardians 1, he was directed well. He knew how to give that character heart. Yeah, Sadly, which is Infinity War as well. Yes, and in, in Infinity War. Um, Guardians 2, he kind of got the Steve Urkel treatment of where he had to be making a joke every single moment of the movie. Yeah. Uh, but that's more so... <laughs> you just made her tell your most embarrassing secret. Sorry, go ahead. I don't like, <sighs> but that's, that's I don't like so... that movie. <laughs> That's more so the fault of the writing and directing yeah. than anything else. Yeah. It's not Batista's fault that he was given that to work with. Uh, so I, I want to – like if I were to check out this movie, I want to see what Batista does in it. Hmm. All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. And, 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 and oh. Oh, Sorry. Did you have one last thought before we go to break? Well, I have a few other things to say about them before we can move on. Um I'm very interested in how they marketed Dune because you know which badly. production company do. Excuse me? They, they marketed the original badly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Because, um, uh, sorry, actually, then uh, then I'll, I'll, I will give you a little bit of history on that super fast. So the, the problem was David Lynch, um, he had a certain vision for how he wanted to do the film, but the studio basically told him, we, this is the movie that we want you to make. And there was a lot of back and forth, and to the point where, if you look closely, you'll notice that it says directed by Alan Smithy, which is the the code name for directors who um t- who want their names removed from projects. So, of course, with that being said, then the, the studio was like, "Well, crap, we don't know how to market this movie because the the story is way too complex for." Uh, general audiences at the time, especially in 1984, to truly understand, because we were just coming off of Star Wars and The Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. So, which actually, you brought up a great, you brought up a great question. Then, how are they going to market such a crazy story, and also, in my opinion, a very convoluted one like Dune? But no, but um, please. Okay. Well, that, and I was also going to say, like, you know, the production company is. Dune's going to make its legendary pictures, right? You know, yeah. if you know legendary, it produced, like, I'll just say big monster kaiju films like Pacific Rim, Godzilla, King Kong, even the last few Jurassic movies right here. Maybe they can go with that angle as sort of like, more like a, uh, I might say this, like, um, you know the sandworms right here in Dune right here? Maybe they use that marketing ploy right here, and you know the Usually, an open every scene you say like a legendary film right here, Lou the Artemis right here though. You can use that in your marketing right here, and I think you got watching Comic Con. That's a sort of the most important thing to do it with Dune right here, and you got to sort of like viral marketing very well. Do like a viral marketing right here. Even some people had had familiar with Dune, use that right here. To make sure and have the audience knows what you're talking about right here. Yeah. Even yeah. with the huge cash flow you've got right here. And one last thing, you mentioned 
I have a few casting ideas for the rest of the cast of Dune right here. And I don't know what the panel's going to think. Just want to think one thing perfectly clear. All I know is that uh, uh, take, take, take a shot every time you hear the words right here. Love you, love you, Jonathan. Thank you for saying it, so I didn't have to. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was thinking the same thing. No, it's all good. It's all, look, we, we all have things that we repeat way too often. I have my own. I've had them for years. So you know what? I'm, it's all good, man. It's, it's all, all good, good. Man. It's all good. <laughs> okay. Um, I have to just okay. I'm just gonna do free work. I'm not gonna get all of it right here. I'm just gonna get the few. I'll just say my ones out of the way first. Um. My actor choice for, I'll just say, I don't know the guy's name, but the Patrick Stewart role, I pick um, Mark Strong Ooh. as that part. Okay. Yeah, I pick Mark Strong the part right here, which is going to be very interesting. Um, on. Because Mark Strong could definitely pull off a, a douchebag like that. Yeah, but it's just sort of like a teacher role right here, basically. Um, I pick the the Brad Dorf character right here. And I pick another odd casting choice. And I don't know if this is going to work, but I'm just going to say, anyways, Jermaine Combat as that role. It's a bit weird. Wait, hold on. Okay. Yeah, I know. It's weird. Okay. But... All right. Okay, here's my favorite Rafa choice. This is going to get... Okay. This is going to be a little questionable at first. But once I pictured that scene right here, I'm actually Chalamet in that part. Yep. And the person I'm about to say in the part right here, you'd think of like, that actually could work. Okay. It's sticking with the singer turn actor profile. I picking Harry Styles as Faye Rafa. Oh. Harry Styles, huh? Yes. I can see it. I can see it. Okay. Yes. So now, okay, because I actually am not 100 percent sure I heard you right. But did you already do a, uh, a, a the the sting guy or? Yeah, I already did that. Oh, sorry, that you, was the, you did. That was yeah. You, you that did. Was the, okay. Wow. When he just said, "Duh, you're right." Wow. <laughs> All right. Well, so with that, that's actually a lot. That that would be a, some fun addition to the cast. And who knows? Maybe Denis might see something in those actors. And who knows? Maybe a couple months from now we'll hear them added the cast. But until then, we're going to go to break. We'll be right back after this to talk about animated sequels, both good yeah. and bad. And here's where some rant's going to happen, ladies and gentlemen. This show is going to get ugly, and I can't wait for it. But the bad news is I'm going to have to actually uh, put the break on mute because a certain somebody had to put uh, copyrighted music in their uh, <clears throat> promo for <clears throat> Multiplex. <clears throat> Co what? Sorry. Anyway, <laughs> we'll see you back in a minute, guys. Don't go anywhere. Hey, everybody. Joe Finley here from Miscast Commentary. Have you been along for the ride while we've been doing the MCU Commentary Marathon? If not, where the f*** have you been? We're going to watch it the way you would have experienced it when you go into the theaters. Yeah. And, that's how and, it's and you would have experienced it with two assholes talking through the whole thing. Yes. The only person who can see the true scope of this is Galactus. He can see the end. Yes. That's it. So think about that, nerds. <laughs> she knows who's the boss in this house. <laughs> uh, <laughs> She's the Angela. The Angela. We all know Angela was the boss. And he is Tony. So Exactly. Oh, this, oh, my God. This <laughs> is so... <laughs> <laughs> Join us every Friday as we present a new full-length commentary for another Marvel Cinematic Universe movie. This has a little bit of Oz in it, too, I think. Like, not the prison, the the wonderful wor <laughs> world of... Miss Cat's commentary. Join us, or don't. I'm not your mom.
Ethan Irwin, the champion, defending in New York. Dan Merle gets a chance to become the three-time champion. If you're already at the $10 tier, you'll get the live event for that night. You can watch it for $2.99 the night of. You don't have to be a patron. Season six is going to be bigger and better than anything you've ever seen. You want to see Merle versus Irwin for the title in New York? Ethan Irwin did something that nobody in this league has been able to do. Be ready, because I'm bringing my A game. And Chance Ellison goes up against Janine the Machine. Janine the Machine about to shut this thing down. I'm not intimidated, not one damn bit. Schmodown live. The battle for New York begins. Let's get ready to Schmodown! And welcome back to the second half of the Who Cares Anyway podcast, uh, the February 1st, 2019 edition. Haha. <laughs> okay. Ladies and gentlemen, it's February second over here. Yes, I know. I'm just being a, a real, a, a real. Uh, I don't know what the fuck. Uh, who, who cares? <laughs> we're we're here tonight to talk about animated sequels in honor of both the Lego Movie Two and How to Train Your Dragon Three. And we actually, uh, our special <laughs> guest tonight, Jonathan Peck, the one, the only, the legend. He actually got to see one of these movies uh, coming up soon. You son of a bitch, and I know exactly which one it was. It was not the one with the dragon. And sadly, you can't talk about it yet, can you? Actually, I can't talk about the Lego movie, too. Actually, the embargo is already broke, so... Oh. Yeah, reviews are up. Yes. So then, okay, just... Then all I'm going to ask is, is a simple yes or no, because everyone here loves the Lego movie. Who does it is one of my favorite films of the decade, and so what, I'll, this is and this and this is the critic consensus I've seen so far on it. Is that it's good, it, like it, it's really good, but it's just not as good as the first one. Would you say that's about right as far as the sentiment towards it? Well, yes, and also it might be a great thing about. Well, first off, the counter about the first Lego Movie though, it's kind of hard to do. Let's be honest with that. Yes. Like, yes. And it's really hard to do like a huge, great follow up to the first movie. And this movie, it's just a smite. Very close it is. And it's a great thing about it. It's still a great movie out of it. Right here, though. And before I get my quick thoughts on it, I just want to tell you something right here. I tweeted out that I'm going to see the movie with my dad at the Hobbit Theater a couple, couple weeks back. And I got like a tweet. Not, there's only one famous person liked my tweet and guess what it was we're gonna zoom it in right here so you can see it real closely boom chris miller Woo huh? Ooh, shoot yes look at you thank you it's Boz awesome it's time i met kevin pollock everything is awesome <laughs> or i took a server i'm not gonna tell that story yet but okay well i'll tell that for another time, so yeah. A good not only that, but for another time. There's another time. <laughs> Talk about good stuff. Okay. Not only that, I got one the executive producer on it. I also like my tweet right here, and went to see the early screening of the movie. So and, and it's really, uh, really great winning dialogue right here. It's such a actually a great message when the movie is trying to do right here for the sequel. Okay. I'm not going to tell you what exactly the message is right here. We're not sort of spoiling it right here. Let's just say the movie starts off where the first movie left off. Okay. I'm just going to tell you that right now. Right here. And more different ideas of it right here. Wait, though. wait, right here or right here? I swear. Or right you, here. You, you are going to make me drunk before the end of the night, man. <laughs> <laughs> At least that would be if I was actual alcoholist. But no, this is just raspberry lemonade, guys. Relax. I'm just drinking water. I'm not drinking. Please be stupid responsible. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, Nico, we're in America. Did you really just say a sentence out loud? Think about who's in the White House. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it sounds kind of wrong now that you now that I think about it. Yeah. 
<laughs> All right. Okay. But no. So. Okay. But no. So that makes that makes a lot of sense in regards to. And and over the overall sentiment, and then as far as the, the setup. Because to be honest, I'm I'm sorry to cut you off, but you actually were starting to do a little bit more than I was hoping you were going to say. I was literally just looking for an answer to my question, but you did a great job of answering it, so thank you. And the reason that I wanted to talk about animated sequels is, much like our conversation on dumb action movies and movies about musicians, this could be a multiple-part conversation. Because there are so many sequels to great animated films, and not all of them are theatrically released. Like... If I wanted to torture myself for two hours, I would do a show where we talked about just the direct video uh, Disney sequels. But I get the feeling I'd be the only one doing a lot of talking. Yes. Uh, Lion King 2, Simba's Pride, The Little Lion Mermaid King 2, one Cinderella 2. Yeah, I actually oh, no, so one wait, and Nico, you haven't even seen the actually decent Cinderella sequel. You poor bastard. Which one? Which one? Three. Twist in Time. Uh, it's actually not bad. Uh, like, if you can get past the first five minutes, which genuinely suck, the rest of the film is actually pretty good. Uh, Mulan 2. Oh! Uh, 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 Jafar's Return. Um, uh, 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 two. Aladdin and the And uh, I'll make the, the argument Thieves. that one's now, better that's than a the good original. One. That's, that's a good one. Which one? Pocahontas 2. I'll make the argument that's better than the original. I don't like the original at all. Wait, which one? Pocahontas, Pocahontas. He's... Oh. Chris, you are wrong. <laughs> Pocahontas is terrible. No. In every but way. You know it's, but you know it's not terrible? You know it's not terrible? Aladdin and the 40 Thieves. And that the is a Thieves? great sequel. Oh, my uh, God. Sequel. Dude, Gimli as Aladdin's dad? Yes, please. I want this. <laughs> and also the return of Robert Williams as the genie. Uh... Sort of, sort of, sort of. At least... Sorry enough, like it that. It wasn't but, very but still. needed, though, sadly. I know, I know, but I love Robert Williams, so I still love Rest that. in peace, Robert Williams. Who doesn't? Who doesn't? Who doesn't love him? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, all right, all right. So, yes, now let's actually start to get into this conversation for real. And let's start this off with a sequel that I know Nico is dying to talk about because he may or may not be wearing a shirt for said movie. And, you know, I... I don't know what to say. Galadriel as Hiccup's mother is amazing. The the villain, uh, it's something Drogo or no no not no 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 no. It's literally Drago. Drago. It's literally there Drago. Thank you. Yes. His name. Drago is a great villain. Jon Snow as this like you know uh, one of his like lieutenants or something. He's wonderful in the in the film. How to Train Your Dragon two is, in my opinion, one of the most underrated films of the decade because nobody talks about it. Absolutely nobody talks about it. And the animation... And also, it came out around the same year as... Speaking, like, go back to the Lego movie. The Lego one came out the same year. If that movie had come out that same year, I think the most talked about anime movie around that year was The Sea of Dragon Jacket 2 and maybe Big Hero 6. <sighs> but they, they kind of left in the shuffle a bit, just a bit. Goddamn Big Hero 6. Like, it's fine, but it didn't deserve the Oscar Oscar win. It, it, didn't, even, like, it didn't even deserve the nomination over the Lego movie, but that's a discussion, uh, a different discussion entirely. <laughs> and, and that's not the conversation we're here to have. But, Nico, go ahead. Fanboy over one of the best sequels of the decade. Okay, so I'm going to start this off interestingly. For the longest time, the greatest animated franchise could arguably be considered to be Toy Story. It would like, and both the sequels to the first Toy Story were fantastic. Whether or not two or three is is the best is still very much up for debate. But we're still no, getting it's not. Toy, but okay, we're, 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 we're getting Toy Story four down the road too. Uh, but How to Train Your Dragon, How to Train Your Dragon, it has been smart in the way it has aged uh, and uh, built upon the lore. Uh, because right after the first movie, we got a couple short films uh, with the DV- uh, in between DVD releases, and yeah, then we got a bunch of, 
Yeah, uh, no, we there were short films as part of the DVD releases, and then there were animated series on Cartoon Network, and then later on yeah. Netflix. Uh, 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 that f- and uh, before the Netflix series, we got How to Train Your Dragon two, and the Netflix series would fill in the gaps in between. And I just love how well that this How to Train Your Dragon is a franchise that has matured with the audience that watched it from start to finish. And just like it's essentially a boy and his dog story told from the perspective of Vikings with reptiles uh, uh, that fly serving as the dogs. Uh, and like uh, it also shows like, you know how in Venom it took a while for Eddie Brock and the symbiote to sort of get along. That's kind of how it worked between Burke and the actual dragons. Uh, uh, like it took a while before they found commonalities between the two and it got to a point where like one could not really survive without the other Burke could not survive without the dragons and the dragons could not survive without Burke it, they became it became part of the they both became part of each other's ecosystems and I love that so damn much I love studying all the breeds of dragons uh, of what they do, what their powers are. I love following the journeys of each rider and how they relate to their dragons. Uh, like it's essentially like a wand choosing you and Harry Potter. The dragon sort of chooses you. Uh, uh, like the the dragon has to respect you as a rider in order to let you ride them. Uh, and I, I just love this so much. And it's gonna pain me a little bit to see this franchise come to an end. Uh, within for me tomorrow, but for the rest of people in a couple weeks. Screw because you, thank Nico. You Fandang- <laughs> thank you, Fandango. Thank you, Fandango. But yeah, I, in my opinion, the two greatest animated franchises of all time are Toy Story and How to Train Your Dragon. And I feel like How to Train Your Dragon has really elevated I... itself to be above Toy Story. Well, so, well oh, that whether or not that will be confirmed is all dependent on how movie number three, The Hidden World, plays out. And so far, it's doing very well. It's 100% on Rotten Tomatoes. 99%. 98. Oh, 98. My bad. 98. Yeah. Whatever. Whatever. It's doing really good on Rotten Tomatoes. This is true. And, oh, by the way, uh, hey, Brian Nussbaum the- in the chat is mentioning the score. Like, How to Train Your Dragon, yeah. both one and two, has one of the best scores of all time. Yeah. John Powell is a musical genius. Uh, yeah, and, and I'm surprised that those two scores are not nominated for Oscars. Like, really, for real. There's some. The first one is. Yep, first one was. Oh, oh really? Yep. Oh, really? Yep. Oh, sorry. 20, 2011 Oscars. Uh, oh, sorry. My bad. Oh, uh, you're fine. <laughs> okay. That's right. Um, the scores itself of both of these movies. You feel you're at Burke. You're a feel at a Viking village while you're flying, though. This pal gets the vibe and the environment very well, though. And the atmosphere of it, where you're listening to the score, really perfect. I listened to one of the songs where I was going to drive down the road right here. I used that music in my head, like, pretend I was flying, just close my eyes a bit right here. Just hear the music. Fly around, where, where no one goes. Now, granted, that's not a song John Powell did. That was a, ba- a song from the band that gets to do like one song per movie for this franchise. Yeah. The name escapes me of that band, but still, the the music but from how you descri- from how you just sang it, it sounds like it's something like one of, like a '90s adult <coughs> alternative, like Goo Goo Dolls kind of band. I'm sure. Here, I'll look. Up, I, I, I got my phone. I'm looking up the name Fine. of you, that you, band. You look so. that up, but then we'll. I'll, I'll oh, give well, my I'll, John Powell has a role, but it's uh, but it's also John Z is the is the name of the person who does that particular song I was just singing. Huh. Okay. Yeah. I, 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 okay. <laughs> anyway. I threw you for a loop there. I sorry. I'm sorry. That's fine. Sorry. That's fine. Anyway, um, I'll I'll get my final thoughts before we move on to the next film. Um. Yeah. No. Like this. This this franchise could be. In my opinion, the best anime trilogy since Toy Story, and well, now I really can't say that because we have Toy Story Four coming out this year. But what I will say is that the second movie was better than it had any right to be. But and while they technically went the "quote unquote" Empire Strikes Back route of having it be a darker film that explores more of the lore, that truly dives into the characters and how they are feeling. 
it does that with a purpose. And that's why I adore that film so much. Which I think, Case, you might make an argument for the film I know you want to talk about. Which uh, might be a little film called uh, Toy Story 2? Oh, yes. Now that is a great sequel. I love yes, Toy Story 2. And just uh, don't say anything about the other sequel because no, you no, are in the vast minority the... on that one, sir. I know, and I don't care. Let's like, just say, let's just combine those together right here so we don't have to go back and forth right here. Even though you don't no, like no, it. No, no, but... no, 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 no. But you don't want to get into the discussion with Toy Story 3 because I legit don't care about that movie and I don't get it. Um, but that's fine. Toy Story 2 is great because it does everything that the first one set up and it continues that. Um, the, fir the first one is a fun movie that introduces us to these toys of Andy. The second one goes into a very interesting um, a story where it really is the question, but what if the, if the toy uh, is done? Like at one point, the toy will be done in s some shape, way, or form, uh, as in uh, either the kit has outgrown it or the toy is um, broken in any way. What does it do then? And that is, a, uh, that is a very well explored in the second one uh, where Woody goes on this uh, or he gets taken away, but he encounters um, – well, Jesse, Bullseye, and everything, and he suddenly realizes that there is more to uh, being a toy than just being the toy of a kid, because he does realize at one point that kid will outgrow him. And we have the most heartbreaking, one of the most heartbreaking scenes in all of Pixar, when we have uh, Jesse's flashback to her previous owner, and it's I cry every single time. Um, so yeah, I think uh, the second one. Uh, d does a lot of great things com uh, compared to the uh, first one, uh, and it has a lot of great parodies uh, of Jurassic Park, The Empire Strikes Back, that kind of stuff, which and is Zerg. awesome. Love it. Yeah, Zerg! I must defeat Zerg! Just Wallace Shawn as Rex in that movie is great. <laughs> Fantastic. Oh. Okay. What? Never mind. It makes perfect sense why you don't like Toy Story 3 as much, because the re films they pay homage to, you don't care about because you don't watch classic film. No. Of course not. All right. Then let's... Uh, move no, 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 but, uh, but I, have, I have bigger and other issues than that with Toy Story 3. I know. Mom and Dad are fighting right now. Please yeah, say, yeah, no, and, like, Here's the thing. Like, legit. Chris hates this... me every time I bring up Toy Story three, so I don't want to discuss that. Yeah, because <laughs> well, and and you know, and, and I'll just quickly say this: it's one of the very few films that genuinely will make me just break the fuck down because of how much it meant to me when it first came out, how much it still means to me because. To, to, to get the really short version of it, I never got the opportunity to have that final scene from Toy Story 3. I never got that chance to have that goodbye to what was left of my childhood. And in, in a way, I, I resent myself for that. So it's very therapeutic that I have a chance to see what that maybe could have been like. And until then, Case and I will forever agree to disagree because it emotionally rings so fucking true to me. As does the second one. I adore the second one. But the third one, I just enjoy that much more. So let's talk about a movie that uh, Jonathan, how about you set us up for your, your next one you want, you want to discuss? Because hmm. I, I, I did Toy Story 2 for Case, and I did uh, How to Train a Dragon for Nico. Before I get into my first my first one I want to talk about, hit us with, hit us with your first one you want to bring up. Actually, I can put that on, too, because, like, if I say this, I'm worried I might do your pick, but... Um, uh, I've seen okay. a lot of movies, man. <laughs> Just say something. <laughs> okay. Actually, you know what? I'm going to pick the sequel out because I know... You and Case never seen it. I don't know. Nico has seen this one yet, but 
going to pick out coming out last year, actually. I'm picking Ralph Breaks the Internet, actually. I actually did see that. So. Yep, Case and Thank I haven't you. seen that. But yeah, no, go ahead. Go ahead, both of you. Okay. okay. No spoilers, please. Please, no spoilers. Okay. <laughs> okay. Without getting in the way, both of the characters of Ralph and Penelope really grow in the movie, though. Okay. Really grow okay. in the movie. And I can't tell what specific detail what I mean by that is they kind of grow as people in that film, though, because they – if you felt like it's been years since you last saw them right here, it kind of feels like a long time. Okay. They've been like best friends for a very, very long time. And but go for the internet though, it's fantastic. Like okay. they go to different places right here, give it right here. And also the Disney Press scene, one of the best parts in the movie. And also, if you get a chance to see the movie, there's a special thing in the end credits right here, which I honest miss it in theaters. But I look for online to tell me there is a special scene right here. I saw it online, and I kind of hate myself that I missed that scene. Okay. And I would have died uh, laughing by seeing it. So I'm not going to say what specific. And credit scene, you say? Yeah. Yes. Nice. Okay, so to piggyback off of what Jonathan said, the first movie was basically about Ralph and Penelope becoming friends. This movie, the sequel, explores, like, what happens when two best friends have different dreams, different goals as to what how they want their on. lives to play out. Uh, let me speak, please. Let me speak. <laughs> uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, no, you're good. You're good. You're good. But yeah, basically like how do two friends who want, uh, how, do, how do you adapt to your friend, your best friend needing space to do their own thing? And uh, the, obviously that's where the growth comes in. Mm. Uh, for for these characters, like they don't want to hurt each other's feelings, but they want to do what makes them happy. And so the it, like it it and I saw this with one of my best friends. So oh, okay. I, I was just like, th there were times where I was like, after seeing this movie, I had to ask her like, are there any are there ever any times where you feel like I'm smothering you in the same way these characters were kind of maybe smothering each other. Not, and it, and if and if so if so what can I do to be a better friend? Uh, uh, like uh, so, this movie made me think about my own relationships with certain people and what I can do to better those relationships, even if it means doing nothing, like doing nothing <laughs> when I've been doing maybe too much of something. All right. Okay. That's. Uh... <laughs> That was good insight. Thank you both for not spoiling anything because, yes, I I, ne I need to see it because I, I really do like the yeah. first one, but, I don't, but just haven't had time. Haven't had time, haven't had the, the necessarily the funds to make it happen, but I am going to check it out when I get the chance. So like as soon as it's on Netflix or something, I'll give it a watch. Uh, Disney and also, streaming service. Disney it's not, streaming it's service. not here yet, so we still have a little time with Netflix. <laughs> also, one last thing before we move on. Um, the new characters in that film are very good, actually. Okay. Right to be handsome's character. Very fantastic. Gal Gadot's character. Oh, that's right. Uh, Taraji, she's in this. Oh, man. Spe well, speaking of yeah. hidden figures. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, so we're going to move on to another film that... Okay. M maybe I misspoke a little bit with the whole... Uh, I don't cry that often thing because this movie also made me cry eight years ago when I saw this in the theater with, with my best friend. Um, that is uh, 2011's Kung Fu Panda 2, a movie that should be terrible, Yeah, the first one. But the first one is so brilliant. It's so much fun. It's funny. The action is phenomenal. Um, and then the second one... <laughs> I, I didn't know what to expect because, sure, you had Gary Oldman add to the cast. I thought, oh, my God, Lord Shen is the best villain of the franchise. We had even more masters like uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme being added to this movie. Yes! <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, and then we also had uh, a, a truly emotional story arc for Poe, which wasn't really there in the first one because we're still establishing him as a character. But now that we're now that we've established him, 
Let's build some layers. Let's get to know who this guy, where this guy came from. And, oh my god. And I know exactly where it was that made me cry. Because, every, like, a lot of people that I knew, they cried at the scene where he actually takes the, the piece of water and starts to do the, the, the really amazing trick with it. For me, it's the final scene with his mother. Where it starts in the 2D animation, that beautiful watercolor picture, painting. And then it switches over to the 3D. And then I'm just like... <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was a blubbering mess, as was my best friend, and we just cried together. It's a wonder. After, it's a wonder he is. It's a wonder he is engaged with and with a child. But <laughs> you know, that's just who we were back then. Uh, yeah. So Jonathan, Nico, you both uh, look very excited by my choice. So please. And, and I was about to say, uh, and, and actually, wait, Case, you have seen Kung Fu Panda 2, right? I have seen all three of That's them. That's right. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I threw you into the bus. Yes. So please, <laughs> let's praise this wonderful film all together. Nico, we'll start with you. Um, so uh, Kung Fu Panda, it's another one of DreamWorks' uh, properties that found so much momentum with the first movie that it was able to not only expand into sequels, but also TV series. It had yeah, it, like special. Legends of Awesomeness on Nickelodeon, and now it has um, a series that follows the events of <coughs> movie number three on Amazon Prime, which I have mm. checked out, and it is very interesting. It puts Poe in a bit of a mentor role, just as movie mm. number three did. Um but yes. you know, in like a more important sense of a mentor role, I'd say for the series than for movie number three. But yeah, just getting to watch Poe grow from like he essentially had a rocky story, like he was a nobody, and then he gets this opportunity of a lifetime to be somebody. Uh, and none of the other Furious Five thought that he could become that somebody, and. He proved everybody, including himself, wrong. He had the, the determination, and he had that moment of doubt, but he overcame it, and he truly proved himself as the Dragon Warrior. And then in the second movie, we're like, where do I come from? Like, I now realize that I'm destined with this big responsibility, but there's a part of my past that's missing, and I can't really become the total package until I have the total package of my, of that memory gap fulfilled. Uh, and in the meantime, we have this crazy peacock who's killing off Kung Fu masters with uh, cannonballs, like, uh, and which reminded me of this old book I, I read, this book series called The Five Ancestors. It's a Kung Fu series of, of novels. Uh, and like the, the big weapon against Kung Fu was the earliest version of the gun. Uh, yep. And... That's essentially the story that I, I was able to relate to in that sense. Uh, but Poe is able to overcome it. He uh, he finds his center. He become he, he becomes even more advanced as the Dragon Master, and he's able to like catch the cannonball and <clears throat> redirect it. Uh, Dragon shout out to Warrior, Avatar from sir. the re Dra Dragon. Oh, did I say Dragon? What did I say? I said the Dragon Master. I was just giving you shit. <laughs> Yeah, but but yeah, essentially, like in the same way, Iroh can redirect lightning on Avatar. Poe found a way to redirect the cannonball, and then we get to movie number three, and Poe finally finds his family. He find he finds he, he, uh, all the other pandas, and figures out where they went, what, uh, where did they disappear to, and so then we get this unique story of like, I am Mr. Ping's son, I am Mr. Ping's son, but I am also the son of this panda leader of this colony. And so now I'm like, and now I'm, and now he's trying to deal with keeping his whole family, not just his adopted family, but his birth family safe in, in preparation for this final threat for this final movie and uh, becoming at, at attuned with his chi, becoming um, uh, the dragon master, as I so uh, eloquently misspoke beforehand. And like, I, uh, if not for how good How to Train Your Dragon was, Kung Fu Panda would probably get a lot more praise uh, in the Fair. public eye than it has. Absolutely. And also, and also I can rank them 
You match about animation trilogies. This is on the round of top three. Whoa. Animation. Well, well, there are a few others I didn't think of, but it's in the top five, I'll just say. Not top three. Take that back. But. I, I honestly wouldn't disagree with you on the top three thing. I, I feel yeah. like it's justified see? to put Kung Fu Panda in the top three trilogies. Okay, if if I hadn't seen a crap ton of uh, you know older films and a good amount of uh, you know anime um, anime franchises, I I would actually agree with that. But I just I've I've seen a lot of good stuff. So, <laughs> but no. In, in case before I throw this to you, uh, Malcolm Lay, our our dear friend Malcolm Lay. Really, you're gonna try to tell me the third one is better than the second one? Granted, the third one is great. Yes. But the second one is just amazing. See, Empire Strikes Back with the three. Hi, Malcolm. Yeah, exactly. Hi, Malcolm. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in. In case, give us your thoughts on Kung Fu Panda 2. Um, to be fair, it's been a very long time since I've seen it, and I've only seen it once. But I remember liking it a lot. I remember it being very good. And yeah, this is a great trilogy. All three movies are great. Uh, I saw the third one in the theater, and I really enjoyed it. Uh, despite one asshole being on his phone all the time. That's what I also remember from yeah. it. Um, but yeah. Um, no, the, these three moves are great. I should probably rewatch them sometimes, uh, especially Same. considering it's uh, it's DreamWorks, and that's now a fandom category, so I probably should study on that. Yeah, um, yeah we're, we're, we're going to need to study if we have a shot against the Arkham Knights. <laughs> this is true. Um, but yeah, like... Um, <laughs> It's amazing that the first one worked in the first place because that the, just the entire premise was stupid and it should not have worked, but it did. And then uh, it's like, oh, so the first one, but yeah, they're they're gonna make a second and it's now gonna. Oh no, wait, it's also, wait what? And and then even the third one is great. So it's like, guys, just keep making yeah. these. They work. They're good. Stay away from the Shrek sequels. And just stick yes. to stick, stick oh, to this stuff. Except for except for the except second, for the second one, and we'll, and, we'll, and we'll get there. We'll get there when we get there. Um, but yes, you know. So Jonathan, uh, give us a, a sum up of your thoughts, because there actually have a couple more that I personally want to get to before we uh, move on to some of the worst ones and then wrap up. So, give us your thoughts on Kung Fu Panda Two. Actually, sort of the same thoughts with Nico and Case right here, though. It's sort of the same thoughts right here that I really enjoy this. I, mean, I saw it in the theaters. With me and my dad right here, and I really enjoyed it right here. I really enjoyed. Right here or right here? I'm gonna keep doing that. I'm gonna keep doing that until I get. Well, old. see, no, okay. At least I'm just trying to keep it to a simple hint, because that's kind of a, like a, just a little cue of hey, you know, I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be nicer about it than Nico is here because uh, it must be those it must be those house night furies. They're just not that nice of people. I <laughs> I hey, I, I'm being nice to you, Nico, and you're not returning me the favor. I love you, Jonathan. I love you. <laughs> but, for, but for clarity, it's right there, right? <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Don't worry about it. Continue. Okay. Right. okay. Okay. So this will quick. Um, I really enjoy Bo's growth in character. I, I love to see... The more of the Furious Five, then we see the last one. Though I loved actually the one funny scene in the movie is actually really cracked me up. Was about it's a very low key scene, but when I think about Crane when he was talking to Mantis a bit, I don't I kind of forgot which scene it was, but they're, they're talking about it right here in a very low key way. That's one of these scenes that actually did crack me up a bit right here. So I would just want to get it there. So that's my thoughts on it. All right, fair enough. <laughs> And let's uh, move on to uh, another film in this this wonderful conversation. And I'm gonna do a, a really a really fast one, uh, just to get this out of the way. Um, Ghost in the Shell: Innocence. Ghost in the Shell is one of the most brilliant, innovative films of the 1980s. I adore it. And Innocence takes all the philosophy that is introduced in this first film about what what truly is the line between machine and man. And explores it even further, and explores. So not Scarlett Johansson. Yeah, no, not not none of that crap. <laughs> no, just no, no, no. 
<laughs> I triggered you. No. Yes, you did. Well done, sir. I hope you're happy. Put shades on. Get, get the goddamn shades on. Exactly. Oh my god. Ugh. No. <laughs> okay. But uh, but all seriousness. Um, I needed that. Yeah. No. Ghost of Shell Innocence. Uh, it, it's a beautiful noir story that uh continues continues the story of everything that happened in the first film and explores a new philosophy that I honestly hadn't even thought of. So I just wanted to quick give that one a shout out because I really appreciate it. And now we'll move on to uh, one that I know Case has a lot to say about and I presume you two have a lot to say about. And since we're still on DreamWorks, let's wrap this one up. And maybe, and maybe let's move on to a, a different uh, studio afterwards. Shrek 2. Somebody wants That's the first me. film, Nico. Oh, oh, so she's saying, but what's the problem, the baby? What's the, the problem? I don't know. Come well, on, maybe I'm in love. On, the world's got yes, you. That, on, that's the song. Anyway. <laughs> this movie is... Just so funny. It is the perfect level of funny and romantic and sweet. I, I can't name I can't name that many things wrong with it. Case, Nico, can you? This is no, this is probably my favorite um animated sequel ever. Because it is just it does everything that the first one set up and it continues so well because the first one is great. Uh and if one animated feature rightfully so. But the first I think, one, actually. Yeah, uh, but them, the se- yeah. the second one, um, like it 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 explores how Fiona and Shrek are, are as ogres together, and how her parents react to it, which is just awesome. By the way, her parents are perfectly cast in Julie Andrews and John Cleese. Yes. That's just Perfect. amazing. Also, Perfect. Jennifer Saunders as the fairy godmother, and Rupert Everett as uh, Charming, what's his yeah. face, uh, Prince Charming. Charming. They are so funny. They work so well. Uh, And it has heart. It has comedy. um, And it's just a delight to watch this movie. There are so many clever things that they come up with. Like, seriously, far, far away with the Hollywood letters. (laughs) That's just brilliant. And 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 the font is based on, like, the Paramount font right here. On the, you know, one of those. The far, far away front land is based off the Paramount Studios Fontland, when you enter, go in there. It's based off around that. So, oh, I that. Okay. But it's just really cool. Know. Like, ser- seriously, they enter far, far away and they play Funky Town, which is just a brilliant choice of a song for that for that entrance. And you see everything is going on. And <laughs> just the moment that Shrek and Fiona show up, it is so funny um, with, with, the, with the pigeon flying into the wall and whatnot. <laughs> It's like there are so many good jokes. It is so cleverly written. Uh, it parodies um, Disney as the first one does, uh, but while uh, but it still does have heart, uh, and uh, you do care about Shrek and Fiona, um, and it's just awesome. That's a fair point you brought up about the parody of Disney because in the first film, I feel like it was that was Katzenberg's way of giving Disney the middle finger. Whereas yeah. in the second one, it's done a little bit more lovingly, like more respectfully. Like, uh, yes, Disney has some silly, crazy stuff that they've done over the years, and uh, uh, you can parody. But the first one is really like, oh, look at the stupid shit that Disney did. We're gonna parody it. The second one is like, hey, Disney is awesome, but there are some clever, funny exactly. ways to and, twist that. And I, I and where the fuck was that in three and four? But you know, yeah, don't well, get well, me started on three and four. <laughs> qu- 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 question, question. Wasn't DreamWorks like a subsidiary of a Disney no, company no. at one point no, in time? No, right? DreamWorks. No, like DreamWorks is sort of like self found by Katzberg, Spielberg, and David Geffen. When they, after they found DreamWorks right here, they just created their own subdivision, like their own animation studio along with that. So, yep, it just created by their own. Beat me to it. Well done. Oh, okay. so, be, and because Jeffrey Katzenberg ran Disney from, uh, okay, I gotta make sure I get the films right. He ran them from Fox and the Hound through 
I want to say The Lion okay. King. Yes. So that's over a decade. Yep. So yeah. Wh- After and other head of Disney tragically died, he was suspected to be the topper head right here, but it went to like a. But, but it went to my. Uh, but it went to Michael Eisner instead. Yeah, and he was sort of pissed off about that. It's like, well, f you guys. I'm going to start my own studio with Steven Evans Spielberg and David Geffen right here, and I'll, not only that, I'm gonna based off get a book rights. Yeah, strike a sort based off of a book. And not only that, I'm going to make not only F you to Disney to F you about different morals of fairy tales. So exactly. basically, yeah. and even Farquaad, if you look at Farquaad, literally, that's Michael uh, Eisner. It, that's literally Michael it, Eisner. It's Michael Eisner. And, plus, and, 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 and literally, just think about his name. Far yes. Quad. Far uh, Quad. Yes. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's kind of a fuck what. Yeah. Yeah. Wait a minute. So uh, he's not a Katzenberg. But and to be fair, Katzenberg is a complete power hungry jackass in his own right. But that's neither here nor there. So yeah. Nico, why don't you give us uh, some thoughts on Shrek Two? Uh so it's definitely out of all the Shrek sequels, it's the one that makes me least uncomfortable. Uh, because uh, like for, what? I have a thing against time travel stuff. So the fourth one kind of made me uncomfortable. Uh, and you would not the like Doctor Who, I, my friend. The the <laughs> third one, I barely remember what happened, other than Fiona had kids and uh, her father. And died. just in Timberlake is Arthur, <laughs> and Eric Isle is Merlin. Wow. Okay. How Malcolm did I Lake coming that? in hot with a hot take. How did I forget that? But anyway, anyway, <laughs> so yeah, num- number two, it, it basically shows like how we want to appear to everyone versus how we actually appear to everyone. And like, how do we deal with that dynamic? Uh, and also Prince Charming is trying to get into Fiona's uh, grill and get into the royal family because he feels it like. I it, think he's trying to get more into like, a grill. Damn. <laughs> but, but, well, it, it shows like there. there's the. A lot of people say that this generation is entitled. Prince Charming in this movie, he's the epitome of an entitled prick. Which, which, uh, which is yep. funny because this movie would have been made during the Gen Y era, not so much the millennial era. Or like yeah. to, to make fun of well, to make fun of Gen Yers versus make fun of millennials, but it's blended both right here. Kind of, it depends which age range you go there. True. True. Good point. But anyway, sorry, sorry to cut you off, Nico. Uh, did you have any yeah. other, anything else, or? Um, yeah, I should probably rewatch this movie because it's sure. been a couple years, and I feel like y- you know you guys are sh- are sharing appreciation for it as if like you just saw it yesterday. And for me, like uh, I'm it's been, I obviously it's been have months, some blind spots. At least. I, it's been I have some blind spots. It's been so years for me, those. but it but it stuck with me a lot, uh, and it still holds up. It still holds up. Yeah. Yeah. The thing is, it's just a very memorable movie, and I love it, and I've seen it uh, plenty when I was younger, but I, not in recent years that much. And that's the reason why the internet has making the mean loads of Shrek, because that's a grown that appreciates it, love about the franchise and the character, though. So, I mean, and plus, weird or not, I mean, plus, Shrek is probably the most memed thing of this entire decade, which I don't know why that is, but that's a thing. By the way, I do, I do want to say one more thing. <laughs> Uh, about Shrek, the the funny thing is, I remember once um, years ago, my grandma ga- came to visit, and she had seen like bits and pieces of Shrek, and uh, she had the preconceived notion, "Oh, uh, this is just stupid garbage uh, for kids." Blah blah blah. Uh, it wasn't for her, and we turned on Shrek two, and she died laughing for the entirety of the movie, and that's awesome. My seventy year old grandma. Loved it. <laughs> I'm glad you finished that sentence because um, I would have died laughing if you had stopped it and she died laughing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, that that was that was dark she, humor. No, she she's still very much alive. Awesome. <laughs> glad, glad to hear it. Yeah. So. <sighs> oh, I almost forgot one more character real quick. Um, Puss in Boots. I almost forgot. Oh. Oh my God! Yeah, wow. Spin-off. How how did he not get brought Banderas. up? <laughs> yeah, because like this was the film that introduced everybody to Antonio Banderas 
as Puss in Puss. In Which Puss. also sort of spoofs around him playing the Master of Zoro. It does. And yeah. my God, he was wonderful in that as well. Well, Legend of Zoro, not so much. But Mask of Zoro was a phenomenal film. We can all agree on that because Martin Campbell directed it. Okay, then I have to see it. Yes, you do. <laughs> and just the one. Don't bother with the sequel. Just, just the one. But a quick hot take, uh, Malcolm, man. You're wrong. Dude, I love you, but how is Shrek 2 not as good? Uh, not not even as good as the ah! original. No, 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 no. That, that, that's not my issue. I get that people like Shrek 1, but that you put Shrek 2 on this, on par with Shrek 3 and 4, that... Ugh. <laughs> then again, you know, that's the thing. Art is a subjective thing. It hits every single one of us differently. Much like yeah, how, both are suggested. much like how I, I'm not really one to talk in regards to my sheer despise of this next film. I'm gonna bring up. Oh boy, around the worst list. Yeah, because you know I. This is one that just I I. Hmm. I hope none of you ever actually see this movie because it's terrible. It's just poorly written, poorly directed, poorly acted. But my God, if it doesn't have one of the greatest dumb villains of all time. For any of you who are, who are nostalgia critic fans, you might notice that he uh, has talked about a franchise that involves some certain little bears. The Care Bears. I am talking about Care Bears 2, A New Generation. That's where you were going? That's where I was going. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I, ha I have seen like two 3D animated Care Bears movies. Like back I was very... I was no, like and, this. And, like, and see, I don't remember and, and, Here's the worst part about it. So... It turns out my sister was a big fan of the Care Bears growing up, and I actually it turns out we had a couple of those movies here at home. So I figured I'd torture myself for three ish hours because they're very short films apiece, and I watched the first two. Bad choice, bad choice. Even though the villain Darkheart in the second one, he's actually kind of a funny villain because. He's like this shape-shifting, evil creep who is like thousands of years old, but his main form is like this little boy uh, kind of going the Pinocchio route, and it's just, it's weird, it's dumb. But Doug and Rob Walker brought up a wonderful point. There's one line in this movie that is just amazing. So I'll just give you a quick setup. So the Care Bears uh, stupidly invite Darkheart into uh, in, into the Care Bear home because they, they he's in disguise. They don't know it's Darkheart, so they're going to have him fix something while they're having a party. And so he's like, so he has this bag with him, which, of course, is what he uses to capture all the Care Bears. And he just says, time for a game of disappearing bears. <laughs> um, um, wait, I didn't catch that. I was yeah, saying, I'm getting a lot of background yeah, noise. Yeah, Let's yeah. Uh, time out this for a moment. There we go. Perfect. Yeah. So no. So did. So where where'd you guys uh stop hearing me? Just repeat the quote. Okay. So, yeah, repeat the quote. So, I didn't hear the quote. So the quote just goes like this. Time for a game of disappearing bears. Ha 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 ha. Wow. Oh yeah. Huh. Uh, that that was a line said. Yeah. <laughs> Malcolm, I fucking adore you. <laughs> he says, I have seen that movie and I agree with you. Yes. <laughs> All right. So, Nico, or yeah, yeah Nico, I'll, I'll go to you next. Give me an anime sequel that you just hate. Um, it sounds like something's going through a wind tunnel, and I I don't know whose end it's on. Um, me neither. I can also hear it, by the way. I me. can kind of hear it. Hopefully, it's not showing up in the actual chat or in the in the in the call or in the stream. But anyway, Nico, 
as we uh, brave this last uh, 13 minutes or so. <laughs> give give me a, give me an anime sequel you despise. Uh, I never really put a lot of thought into like what's on my worst list because like I don't like to think about the movies that I dislike unless it's burn after reading. Uh, I don't uh, I, what? I like to think more. About it. <laughs> <laughs> Triggered. <laughs> I for the record, I never saw burn after reading. Proceed, sir. But um. Yeah, go to Jonathan or Case, and I'll come up with something before the night is over. Actually, actually, you know what? I actually I got one. Yo, not please, say Jennifer. it's a horrible movie, but was the more disappointed the more I go back to rewatch it. Unfortunately, I'm picking Client with a Chance to Meet Balls two, and the reason I picked that movie because going back to our sort of our thing about Lego Movie two, Lego Movie two. It did not directed by Phil Lord and Chris Miller. They basically wrote the screenplay. And I watched Lego Movie 2. You feel like they're actually their movie, even though they didn't technically direct it. They just, you felt their dialogue and a really sharp humor. And that's the reason I kind of love the sequel of it right here. Same thing with kind of like Phil Lord kind of wrote the script with Into the Spider-Verse right here, though. You feel like it's not technically directing the movie. You feel like it's their movie a bit right here. With Cloudy 2, on the other hand, you felt like the idea, but not the wit, charm, or humor at some parts. And even I were in, when I saw this movie in theaters, I was like, yeah, I liked it a bit. And I got it on DVD. The more I grow to rewatch it a bit and bit, my views on the movie kind of strangely down a bit, unfortunately, because there's a legit, a great idea right here. Take and a you shot. could work Take right on those premise right here. What, excuse me? You did the right here again, so I said take a shot. I, damn it. All right. <laughs> what I'm saying is, like, they have an interesting premise right here. I love the idea of Boot Island right here, though. And basically, half the jokes just don't work for the most part, though. Even some of them kind of more misses right here. You can tell there is a story cred of the movie, but it didn't work the dialogue, the humor, or even the wittiness right here from that film. So that. I was let down for that movie, and it's kind of sad because they have an interesting idea with this thing with the first class chance of people, which is brilliant. Like, kind of the most unseen anime film. Oh, so you actually do oh, like yeah. the first one. Yeah, everybody loves that movie. I don't. No, I, I, I can't stand the first one. And I really, really didn't like the second one. Okay. Like you, right. you, 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 you wasted Bruce Campbell and Neil Patrick Harris. That's unforgivable. Oh, 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 that is a really? sin. That is a sin. Hey, wait, hey, uh, no, 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 no. Bruce Campbell did not waste this. But same thing with Neil Patrick Harris, though. To be fair on that one, don't do so. But you wasted. Thing? They wasted Bruce Campbell. You do not do that. That is a. Like, they committed the ultimate sin, which is the ultimate sin Congo made. Yeah. I... We just discuss it another time about things about the movie, so we're not gonna... Anyway, all right, all right, all right, all uh, right. Anyway. Uh, now I can't see myself. Um, we still got you. We still got you. We got you. Okay, all right. It'll fix itself. Anyway, that's my... Sort of my choice, so there. Fair enough, and yeah, the second one really stinks, in my opinion. <laughs> Sorry, but you know, <laughs> um, the case without going to the obvious well for you, give me an animated sequel that you don't like. Well, there is an obvious one, and I'm just gonna bring it up because I, I love Pixar. I really do. Most of their movies. But there was a time between 2011 and 2013 that they were just producing hot-ass garbage. And that started with the absolute worst movie that they possibly could have made, Cars 2. Yes. The first yes. Cars is a fun, good movie that I enjoy very much, actually. Um, not one of the best Pixar movies, but a fun movie uh, nonetheless. But what the fuck did they do with Cars 2? I will never understand this. Seriously, um, in the first 
in the first and even the third cars, because I actually uh, watched the third cars and liked it. What they respect in both of those movies is that the cars are cars, which is in every Pixar movie, like the main thing, treat the uh, the object or creature that you have as the object or creature that it is. In, the, in Cars 2, they essentially treat cars like people. And cars can do everything. They can... Uh, it's so fucking stupid. I don't know what the fuck they did with it. It is a garbage movie that I watched the first time and I could barely finish it. And the second time, I once again could barely finish I don't think I finished it the second time, though. Um, because it is just so bad. Um also, the decision of giving uh, Mater a bigger role, I don't know who the fuck came up with that. Mater is a decent sidekick. Mater kid, was the right? biggest selling toy. Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. In, in, in that regard, then kids are stupid because what the fuck? But yeah, look, uh, I know that the Cars movies get made because it sells toys and that's what they are banking off. But at least the first and the third are fun. They're good. Uh, not great or anything, but they're fun and good, so harmless. I'm okay with them. But the second one is just so bad that I'm like, what the hell did they do? Pixar is a smart studio, but between 2011 and 2013, they were just like, oh, let's just make uh, whatever. Because uh, mm. Cars 2 is a garbage sequel to a good movie. Uh, Brave is a Disney movie made by Pixar, and it's not good. And then you have Monsters University, which is a prequel to a good Pixar, uh, Pixar movie, but Monsters University also is garbage. Um, uh, so I I don't know what happened in that time. At least they came back in 2015 with the best Pixar movie that I've I could have asked for. Uh, but yeah, Cars 2 sucks. <laughs> well, well, okay, so... It's been a long time since I've seen Cars 2. But going back, to that way. About, going back to what I said about Suicide Squad 1, um, sometimes you don't go for the plot. You go for the characters. And child me was very intrigued by the characters in Cars 2, especially the character of Mater and how he was just like, he was just this humble guy who was in like uh, the right place at the maybe the wrong time, and he gets this opportunity to be something more than what he is, uh, and that it, that kind of intrigued me. That story kind of intrigued me, especially considering he sort of finds love, uh, and mm. you know we also get to see the world. We also get to see the world uh, in terms of Lady McQueen is going on this racing tour all over the place. And the shades are on, and now I'm getting weird looks from behind those shades. Uh, but they're, 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 I feel like there's at least a justification for this movie's existence. I mean, and oh, in, uh, in that regard, um, there is. There is. I, I'm, I'm not going to argue there is that there money. is. Money. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but that's not going to excuse the quality of the shitbox. <laughs> <laughs> That was wonderful. <laughs> and, okay. and by the way, uh, I should like the second one the most because it has the most racing and it actually has Formula One cars, which I love. And it actually has a cameo by um, one of my favorite Formula One drivers, Lewis Hamilton. I was saying, yeah. I thought, I, what, what, but, oh, for, yeah. For, but still, yeah. for some fucking reason, I hate the movie. <laughs> and also, hey, Doman, you said Cloudy had wasted Bruce Campbell? They totally waste Bruce Campbell in Cars 2, though. That's People true. They waste him there, too. <laughs> again, I've seen the movie once, and I refuse to go back and watch it again. I will yeah, not no. subject myself and I think to I Cars figured, 2. And I think I figure out what the main problem with Cars 2 is, which, not say unspoken truth, but sort of like, I'll just say very carefully, very self-indulgent of uh, one sort of person behind it, and he basically basically the only it was to make. it was John yeah. Lasseter's <coughs> wet dream that he just splooged on onto celluloid, and yeah, that and it shows. It shows because yeah, and, and, and that's a shame because John Lasseter was a great animated director. He was a great animator, anime director, and then well, Maybe. the wheel the yeah. wheels kind of came loose, and it makes way too much sense when you stop to think about it. So, I think yes. that's gonna do it because like i said there there are so many more movies that we can mention there's so many more movies that i personally will want to get into sometime because 
man, there's so much worse. And I know for a fact that there will be an episode of this show where we talk about just the directive video D- Disney DVD sequels. Uh, I won't. That's fine, Casey. You know what? And, and hey, you, you mentioned that there might be a couple uh, uh, weeks in April that because you'll be with your lady, it might not time timing wise might not, not might not necessarily work out. Yeah. So that's true. You talk about it. Then. We'll talk about it then. But until then, everybody, thank you so much for tuning into this week's episode of the Who Cares Anyway podcast. Thank you so much to the chat. Thank you so much to uh, Jonathan Peck and, my, of course, my panel of Nico and Case. Ryan will be back next week for actually the first time uh, in a couple weeks where we haven't had a guest lined up. And you know what? We might keep it that way. Unless uh, Nico pulls a fast one on me and maybe gets one of his uh, Thon buddies to show up. But you never know what could happen. <laughs> but until then, uh, Nico, speaking of you, where can the good folks find you online? Find me right here on Dedicated to Art. You can find me over on the newly established Combat Wrestling Network uh, on YouTube with Hunter Chambliss. We got trivia. We got other wrestling-related stuff, so stay tuned for that. Personally, you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, at Nico Suave Regoli. That's N-I-C-O-S-U-A-V-E-R-E-G-O-L-I. The official name is listed on the screen you're watching right now. Yes, it is. Uh, and, of course, Multiplex Entertainment. That's the name of the Facebook group and the YouTube channel. The Twitter's at MultiplexYT. The Instagram is Multiplex Entertainment Network. The T-Public is just Multiplex. Buy our awesome shirts. And finally, thank you to everyone who donated to Trivia for Thon. Uh, Chris will add the link in the description of this video below so you can still donate. There's still time. Uh, February 15th, I believe, is the cutoff date. So we broke the 6,000 goal. Let's see if we can break it a little bit further. Absolutely. Jonathan Peck, our good guest. Where can the good folks find you online? Um, you can find me on Twitter at Instagram at jpeck1098 around both Instagram and Twitter right here. That's the only social media outlets I got. So All right. you can find me around this, around the socials, just saying that right now. And in a few days, I'm preparing a Super Bowl party. So, yeah. Nice. There you okay. go. Right. Go go Rams, as much as it kills me to say that. Case, where can the good folks find you? We have our former – I have my former offensive coordinator is now the head coach, so I have to work for that guy. Yeah. Fair enough. Case, what can the good folks find you online? You can find me uh, here on this channel uh, on Resistance Recaps, on Schmodown Reactions, when the Schmodown actually gets uploaded on time, of course. Uh, And um, Sorry, Christian. Like the video and uh, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, of course. Uh, You can also find me over at Multiplex Entertainment where uh, what Nico mentioned. um, I uh, actually faced Nico in a TV match uh, recently. If you haven't seen that yet, uh, check it out because I beat him and that's fun. (laughs) I kid. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, Yeah, which uh, makes sure that I'm now in the final of a tournament. Uh, So look out for that whenever uh, we have it. Um, also, that's a movie guy on Twitter <laughs> and Case Cornelius on Facebook, and I think that's about it. Absolutely, and uh, so, sorry for the shade there, uh, Schmodown fans, but trust me, it's sadly the episode still hasn't dropped. But you know what? That's okay. We were planning to shoot a reaction tomorrow anyway, and I can't wait for that match to drop because season six is finally upon us. I'm excited, I'm ready, um, and I'm ready to root on for chance. I, I can't believe I'm saying this. But I'm also ready to ruin for Janine because either one, they're both great. But that being said, you guys can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, Stardust, and Letterbox at Skywalker Domer. You guys can follow this very channel on Twitter and Instagram at D2A Channel. Please like our Facebook page. Please check out my new single, Don't Give Up, on my personal YouTube page. And uh, <sighs> that ought to about do it. So from all of us here at Dedicated Art, for Jonathan Peck, for Case Cornelosa, for Nico Rigoli, I'm Chris Doman. We'll see you guys next time. Take care! Yeah! God damn it.